Today's episode of the Gold Cast is not sponsored by anything today. Today it's uh, it's with a heavy heart that we say rest in peace, Dwight Clark. It's really torn up today thinking about that. It was pretty pretty sad news. Um, you know we did that Dwight Clark reunion special episode a couple weeks back. You should definitely check it out if you missed it. Um, we talk, we go really in depth about the Sports Illustrated um, article about the reunion that Eddie D held for Dwight Clark. And we just wanted to say uh, thank you, Dwight Clark, for all the memories, condolences to his family, the 49er organization, the 49er faithful. Uh, you know, the catch began everything. It's the, it was the start of it all. And... Uh, I mean, talk about one of the most beautiful, craziest catches of all time. And and what marked, what highlighted a great career across the board. He had an amazing career. And um, I guess the only solace I can see in it is that uh, that Dwight is now resting and he can finally, the pain is gone. And I think that's probably the best part about it is that he is now at peace. Anything you want to add, Ray? Just that, uh, you know, the Bay Area is going to miss a truly iconic legend, you know, and he'll always be remembered for the man who made, you know, completed the play, the pass from, or completed the, the play from Joe Montana to really ignite the 49ers dynasty back in the, uh, the 82 championship game against the Dallas Cowboys. So that'll be a very, very fond memory that'll be etched in history so that's great for him and i'm sure the dwight fam the the clark family is very proud of that at the same time uh it's pretty sad that he's that he went the way he went you know what i mean like from being super healthy and athletic and having a a great career and a good career with the organization afterwards you know covering niner news you know it's unfortunate so you know hearts and prayers go out to the clark family Absolutely, and uh, I like Luna's uh, special appearance in the background. Luna the dog. That was the, I like her little <laughs> guest star appearance on the Goldcast. Oh my God, more like an, an annoying uh, but, guest appearance. <clears throat> <laughs> um, yeah, definitely, I concur with everything you said. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna pose a challenge. I already went on Twitter and did this, and I would I think we should all do it. Eddie D. Bartolo had commissioned NFL Films to make a 40-minute documentary on the life of Dwight Clark, and he commissioned it for their special reunion. And um, it had uh, interviews with Joe and you know all kinds of people that had played with him or coached him, and they played it at his reunion. I already tweeted at NFL Films that I think they should release that video and sell it and the and some of the proceeds should go to ALS. So 49er faithful, Goldcast Nation, uh, go on to my Twitter page and you can retweet it. You can copy and paste it. I don't really care. You can go right at them, however you want to do it. But go on to t- Twitter and let NFL Films know that they should sell that. We should be able to buy a copy of it and some of the proceeds should go to ALS. And I think that that is a a great way that we can serve his memory. And I, for one, would definitely buy it. I'd love to see an NFL films about the life of Dwight Clark. You know, I think that'd be super awesome. So this is kind of my challenge that I'm posting to the Goldcast Nation. Go online and do that. Couldn't agree more. I mean, we have a cousin who has ALS. So, you know, we have, uh, you know, experience within the family uh, with that unfortunate disease. So, you know, share the love. Share share your... uh, share the uh, commitment to, to getting over the hump. Yep, absolutely. And Raymond, uh, with that, uh, speaking of Twitter, why don't you let them know where can they find us? You can like us on facebook.com slash the goldcast. You can also follow us on Twitter at the goldcast underscore. You can also follow us on Instagram at the goldcast. You can also follow us. Um, <laughs> Never mind. You can subscribe to us via iTunes. What the hell was that? 
I th- I thought I had already I thought I had already read through uh, I thought I hadn't read through any other social media platform that requires a follow, but that's Twitter and Instagram. There is no more. Anyway, subscribe, like. Uh, you can also subscribe to us via <laughs> iTunes, YouTube, and Stitcher, all under the same moniker of Goldcast. Like, subscribe, and comment. We'd love to hear from you. And all right, we'd love there to it is. Back when we can. Definitely the wonkiest, maybe one of the wonkiest intros after such a heartfelt statements from you and I about Dwight Clark. Maybe that's how Dwight would have wanted it. Let's let's keep it light. Uh, let's go back. Woo! Huge week behind us. Huge week ahead of us. Warriors, Warriors, Warriors. Two wins away from a dynasty and delivering a second dynasty here in San Francisco in the Bay Area. What a time to be alive. We're going to talk all about it after the intro. So let's get busy. San Francisco, are you ready? This is the Gold Cast. Boom! Welcome to another edition of the Gold Cast. We are the voice of the Bay. I'm your host, Rudy Swiss III, and with me is my brother, my co host, Raymond Solis the First, baby. Boom! Oh my God. What a journey from Game 7 in Houston, coming back, beating James Harden and the Houston Rockets to an insane Game 1, insane Game 1 against the the uh, Cleveland Cavaliers and what had to have been the weirdest ending I've ever seen to an NBA Finals game to the arrival the arrival again of Steph Curry in game two, breaking the record for most threes in a game. And we all know the shot. It's iconic. We're going to see it for the rest of time. I'm sure, I'm willing to bet we're going to get one or two more images, but I'll tell you right now, if the finals were to end today, the final two images that we would see for the rest of time, just like uh, Dwight Clark's The Catch, how we see it every year, you know, every every year. We're going to see it till the end of time. The two, the two playbacks that they are going to show from this, from this series is, of course, J.R. Smith running the ball out to the three-point the, the three line and costing the, the Cavaliers an opportunity to win this game, to win game one. And then Steph Curry's step back from about, I don't know, 40 with the shot clock down to about like 1.5 seconds, he he tosses it up so high, it looks almost vertical. It goes out a frame of the camera, and then when it comes back in, it's nothing but net. And that that shot in the fourth quarter catapulted. It just completely catapulted that team into into uh, I think the rest of that game and ending the Cleveland Cavaliers. It was. An incredible finish. Those are the two images that I think are going to come up the most. Uh, Ray, let's get into it. Let's talk a little bit about. I feel like Game One is probably it's been covered ad nauseum by everybody. Um, I'm going to say first before I hand the mic to you. This has just been a phenomenal run. We're not even we're not even close to done yet. We still have a minimum of two more games, probably three. I think three is pretty fair, but it's just, you know, we've kind of been waiting for Steph Curry to really have his NBA Finals moment, and it looks like we're on the precipice of it. It's here, and it's really exciting. This team, someone described this team as the greatest offensive team in NBA history, and they might be right. Even if we... If we win, and I'm not saying we're going to win, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to, you know, count those chickens before they've hatched. But if we win this time, and even if we, we probably won't, I just don't think it's so hard to go back a fifth time. But I would be hard pressed to believe that there aren't more championships ahead for this team, you know, beyond this one. But let's stay focused on the present and on the now. This has just been an electrifying time, and it reminds me again why it is so, so exciting to be a San Francisco sports fan. We are on 
the cusp of possibly witnessing a second dynasty, Raymond, in the same decade. A second dynasty. I mean, just let that soak in for a minute. Three championship rings from the Giants. Three from the Warriors. Eight appearances in eight years. All three sports. What a time to be a a San Francisco sports fan. Now I pass it off to you. Uh, Thoughts, feelings on game two. Where are you at? So considering what happened in game one, and I didn't have the chance to share this prediction with the audience, but what I thought was because I think that the Warriors are aware that they had some fortunate calls that fell in their direction, allowing them to, you know, play in overtime. Although to be just to be perfectly clear for some of the naysayers, by rule, the referees can examine that play. And if they find that, the position of the player was contrary to the initial call, they can overrule that call and change it. Just like in football when they do a review, same thing. Only people saying, no, they can't, they don't have the right to look at that play. Yes, they do. You don't, it doesn't have to be in the restricted zone for them to have to be able to review it. Two things have to be, have to be in place for them to even enable that rule. A, they have to be in or near the restricted restriction, restricted zone. And B, it has to be under two minutes in regulation which it fulfilled both of those requirements. Anyway, uh, I, I digress. What I thought was going to happen was they were going to come out and play the exact same game to say like, hey, what we did in the first game had us in that game, and we were on the verge of winning that, or possibly winning that game. However, the contrary to that strategy would be that the Warriors are aware of the circumstances. And not only that, they're aware of the fact that they let LeBron James run free in the first game, equating to 51 points, which is, you know, he joins an elite group of players, uh, very few that have done that in the finals game. So the strategy is very simple. We're going to play tighter defense, and we're also not going to let LeBron James roam free the way he did in the first game to equal 50 points. So I said he probably, that total would probably get cut in half. That's what I thought it would might be. So you know, 25, 26 points. He ended up with 29, so it wasn't too far off the mark in that regard. What happened was exactly what I thought would happen. The Cavaliers did exactly what they did in the first game for the most part, only they tried to mix up the switches even more so, and the Warriors just said, all right, if you're going to do multiple switches, the Warriors' offensive strategy is predicated on on on-ball and off-ball movement. So they're playing right into the Warriors' strategy. All the Warriors have to do is wait for the wrong switch to hit the wrong player. And that all that player has to do afterwards is either distribute the ball to somebody who's in the paint or in the, out in the arc or take the shot themselves because they have a mismatch. And in this case, Curry had mismatches left and right. If you put a big on Curry, that's a mismatch. You can say that, yeah, the... The, the advantage the big has is he has height over Curry and can have potentially block him like Kevin Love. He's seven feet. He can obviously block Curry. However, those bigs do not have the lateral speed to keep up with Curry. And so all Curry has to do is juke him and cross over and move laterally to get an open look, which he did multiple times. He did it multiple times. Look, go back and watch the film. He did it almost the entire time, so, uh, especially Kevin when Kevin Love was on him because Kevin Love can't move that quickly. If, if he were to stay right in his face, then Kevin Love would have the advantage. That wasn't the case. Curry had his way and ended up with nine threes as a, as a result. And that's exactly what happened. So I was, I was, when I was watching, I was like, oh, yeah, this is exactly what I thought would happen. And they ended up blowing them out in the fourth quarter. It was still like kind of like the Warriors dominated the entire game. They had, it seemed like they had complete control every time the Cavs made a run to get within five or six or seven the Warriors had a three for that answer right back or a turnover or something like that whether it was KD making a three whether it was Curry making a three or even in the first quarter the first like six or seven shots were just layups and dunks I mean the 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 Cavs just let a free lane open in the first quarter of the game and it was it was crazy I was like wow like so not only are they trying to do the They're letting the Warriors roam free. He plays right into the Warriors' offensive scheme. There's nothing that they could do. I don't expect them to do that in this next game because here's here's the flip side of it. The Cavs had 
multiple, multiple open looks from LeBron James driving with the ball because he was basically playing point guard LeBron that night. So he was driving the ball, finding open shooters on the perimeters, distributing the ball out to one of them. They would have an open look, shoot and miss. They're terrible on the road. I expect them. So the Warriors, the only adjustment the Warriors need to do, this is assuming the Cavs are going to try to do the same thing, is they need to tighten up the defense around those open looks because heaven forbid, if those, if they're playing at home, which they play very well at, if they do the same strategy, a lot of those open look misses that we saw the last two games are actually going to translate. The odds are going to start to play in their favor, not only mathematically, but also because of the comfort, psychological comfort level of playing at home that the Cavs seem to have done very well at. So I expect a lot of those shots to go in. However, if they're contested by our defense by playing tighter, then we can we can mitigate some of those shots. But other than that, it was exactly what I thought would happen. And it, it almost went down to a T. The only thing I didn't predict was the score. I didn't expect them to get blown out in the fourth. I thought it would possibly happen in the third. But Cavs have been hanging in there in the third quarter. And the fourth quarter, Curry just went crazy. After scoring only one point in the third quarter, he actually saved all that, ended up exhibiting, expending all that juice in the fourth quarter by knocking down five. It was incredible to watch. It was jaw-dropping. Like, I love dunks, and I think dunks are super cool. I do. But for me, I don't know. I, I just, I, I, this might sound like NBA blasphemy. I just, I just prefer watching a three-pointer. It's just fucking awesome to see a ball just loop into the air. I, I, to me, I kind of, I've described it. It's kind of like the, it's like, it's like, uh, it's basketball's version of like, uh, a breakdancing pose or like EDM music where there's like this rise and then this drop. And there's just like this, there's just this, I don't know. There's this wonderful feeling of exaltation to watch the ball arch arch through the air travel such a long distance and then hit inside the hoop it's incredible to watch and like watching Steph Curry it like it makes me like I don't know I lose my mind I was jumping there was like three what three of those different three-pointers I jumped off my couch and was like running around going what was that I've never seen anybody do that it's just so jaw-dropping to see these guys pull off these incredible three pointers, it is the equivalent of like you know the 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 dunk was legalized what in the eighties, I think is when it was legalized, um, in professional play, and it was the eighties or late seventies I don't know one of the two, but that was such an awe inspiring thing to behold in its era and in our era it's the three point shot and I just love seeing it I love watching the way the Warriors play and they really play like a team and it's incredible to see them at this level playing at such a high high level and I mean I got to give it up to the Cavs as you were mentioning the Cavs they have hung in there they have withstood both three-quarter blitzes and have managed to hang on and the team itself has kind of rallied around LeBron James which is impressive but it's not enough and nothing makes me happier than watching the Warriors uh, run LeBron off the court. He's definitely not one of my favorite car- uh, players out there. Andy Laird, uh, friend of the Gold Cast, you know, comments on YouTube, comments on Twitter. He uh, he was asking me about about Cavalier Chris online. And for those of you who remember last year, before the start of uh, Warriors Cavs three. There was a guy named Chris, who I called Cavalier Chris, who was a, a, a Cavs fan, and we met at one of the, at a bar I used to work at, and he, we met, and he was, we were totally cool, we got along great, and then I asked him where he was from, and if he was excited about the NBA Finals, and he's like, oh yeah, I'm from Cleveland, and I was like, oh, he's like, where are you from? I'm like, I'm from San Francisco. And we kind of looked at each other and it was like this mood shifted in both of us. And it was like, oh, wow, you're, you're with the enemy. Oh, wow, you're with the enemy. And like we were cool, but like, man, you could tell there was a lot of heat. And we, 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 we debated back and forth. And I remember him saying he believed that the Cavs were going to win in five 
And I, I remember telling him, I said, you have no defense. What are you guys, guys going to do defensively to stop this team? And I remember him saying, I'll never forget him saying, I don't think that's really going to matter in this series. And I'm like, have you ever watched any professional game in your life? What do you mean not going to matter in this series? This is defense. De- now, obviously, basketball is the most offensive sport in the world. I get all that. But what what you bring in defensively matters so much more in the post than it does in the regular season. And it reared its ugly head big time last year, and it's doing it again this year. And uh, Andy Laird was asking me, you know, about Cleveland fans, you know, and if I'd run into any. I, I, I'll never forget, right before game one started, when I told him, I said, uh, he said, what do you think? I said, Warriors in five. And he was like, wow, you are out of your mind. And he was like genuinely, I could tell he was really upset. He was genuinely pissed off at like at like the audacity of me even even considering that this game would be done in five and that they would actually lose. And uh, he, <laughs> he left, right before he left, Ray, I told him, I said, you know what the great part about this is? Chris, you know what the great part about this conversation is? And he said, what? I go, one of us is wrong right now. He had said Cavs in five. I had said Warriors in five. I said, the best part about this conversation is that one of us already is wrong. And we're going to find out who. And that is the last time I ever saw him. (laughs) He never came back. He never came back ever again. His his poor ego, his poor ego couldn't (laughs) even go back into the business establishment to face the fire. And it wasn't even all that crazy of fire. It's not like you guys bet money or he would have to, you know, uh, pay for other people's drinks in the bar. It was merely pride and ego. He's like, I, I don't even want to deal with this. I'm out of here. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, it was, it was a great moment. Andy Laird had asked about it. So I, I will give a shout out to our buddy, Andy. Uh, there, there it is. No, no, no Cavalier Chris sightings this year. Um, never, never been back, never been back again, which I thought was great. Uh, that was pretty funny, but going back, it's, it's exhilarating to see where the Warriors are and to see them really lock in to the level that they're capable of. And we've, I thought, I thought we really saw that in game six and seven of the last series. I wasn't even hopeful going back. I was really nervous. We talked a lot about this last week on the Goldcast. I was really nervous. I had a lot of anxiety going into that game and to see them pull that out and grind it out. You know, they were they were behind in the first half. They uh, you know, they really Houston played uh played a real smart defensive game. They allowed Draymond Green to get a lot of open looks and they kind of kept baiting him into these really bad threes and then they were getting a lot of defensive and offensive rebounds. A lot of second looks second and third chances warriors were losing the rebound game uh were getting smothered on defense and then they completely flipped the switch in that in the second half of that game and i think you see the same exact thing here where as you said Cavs come out with a really strong game plan they punch the warriors in the mouth pretty good they they really shock them warriors are through a series of you know a little bit of luck mixed with just some poor decision making by the Cavs are able to come back are able to make it through in overtime and then in game 2 the, the warriors come out and they punch them in the mouth the second we started JaVale McGee i knew we were probably going to win that game because Kerr cuz i was i was thinking it we even talked i think you and i what, talked on the phone about this minute, offline pause. like why, hey they should why, start JaVale. why were you why were you so convinced just based off of JaVale McGee starting it wasn't it wasn't the fact that J- JaVale McGee was starting. It was the fact that I knew that the Warriors were going to come out and with a completely different game plan. It had nothing to do with JaVale McGee. Does that make sense? JaVale McGee was the symbol to me. I go, oh, here we go. The Warriors are coming out with a completely different game plan tonight, and I don't think the Cavs are going to be able to adjust. That's exactly what I thought. Does that make sense? Got it. And I got it. It looks like he might play. On Wednesday, I don't think he'll pretty sure he's going to come off the bench at this point. Do we think is is Iguodala coming back at all this series, or is he just done for the year? Yeah, he's had five days without any pain in his knee, so he he didn't have any pain 
he was already three days into zero pain by the time Friday came along. So why he didn't play in the last game is beyond me. Oh. I think they're just being cautious because well, he's valuable. Well, do you think he is valuable, but do you think also Kerr goes, okay, we can win these, we could probably win these first two at home, activate Iguodala for Wednesday, game three in Cleveland, and really lock this down and, 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 and get a third win, go three in a row? Perhaps, you know, you know, you risk hurting him and then you lose him. So might as well activate him on the road. I mean, that could be part of it too. I think it's a combination of both of them. They're trying to preserve his health because he's a pivotal piece in the second unit, particularly on the defensive side. And because if they were to play him too soon and he gets re-injured, then they're right back where they started. Yeah, I get that. I totally get that. Well, hopefully he gets activated for game three. Uh, I really would love to see him out there and get on the floor. This is just incredible, man. This is an incredible time for Bay Area sports. This is such an incredible time. It's exciting. We're two wins away. Warriors, Cavs, four. You know, it's also, I'll tell you something funny. You know, I always like, Raymond. Raymond's the greatest fan of in the game. I like to always come at things from a fan. And uh, that's just what makes us the killer combo, Super Solis Brothers in the hails. <laughs> So the thing I find interesting is that we've become that like hated team. People like hate our freaking guts and uh, like how we hate the Patriots or we can't stand any team. I can't stand any team LeBron's on. You know what I mean? Like I didn't like the Heat. I don't like the Cavs. And here we are. These two teams have met four times in a row. And (laughs) I've heard so many people talk about how they're just so overseeing these two teams. And I get it. But if you're a Cleveland fan and a Golden State fan, this is kind of badass. And I'll never forget our buddy Jordan Chappelle, who, uh, a good friend of ours who came on to the Goldcast uh, a couple months ago. Him, He's from Chicago. And uh, I remember him saying that we. I was saying, I don't want to see Warriors Cavs 4. And he had said, no, we have to have Warriors Cavs 4. And I was like, why? Why do we have to have Warriors Cavs 4? And he goes, we have to have it because LeBron has to lose six. He has to lose as many championships as Michael Jordan won. You cannot be the GOAT if you have lost as many rings as Michael Jordan won. And I was like, oh, that's good. That's good. That gives that does give me some extra motivation there. So if this goes down and we can pull this off and we deliver the sixth loss, there's no way he gets to be the GOAT. Am I right? Do you agree with that? I think he completely exits the conversation. Maybe in terms of like regular season accolades, sure. Or maybe some playoff records, yeah. But you don't get to be the greatest of all time. You get to be the greatest of this era, sure, I'll give that to you. With some interruptions, you know, by the likes of, you know, Kevin Durant and Steph Curry, players like that. You know, to, James Harden flashing a pan to a lesser degree. But as far as the greatest, greatest, no. The, it's, you know, Max Kellerman falls, he's, he's so obsessed with stats that it often blinds him from some of the stats that matter more, more so than just your laundry list of stats. And that's the stat of winning. If you win the pinnacle, the mess of the best, a lot of times that will trump all this crap that you've done in your career or somebody who hasn't won all this crap doesn't mean they don't get get to be a hall of famer, but they don't get to be in this other category, this other category of championship pedigree because you've actually won at the highest possible level. And Jordan's done that six times. And, you know, LeBron's on the verge of losing and and that's losing that same amount. So I, with with Jordan's prediction, I mean, I was like, I don't want to see it again. I'd love to see another opponent, but you know, for for that kind of poetic justice to really silence, to really silence the uh, the debate, uh, that's pretty much what needs to happen. I agree. Is it is it wrong, Ray? I'm going to ask you a question. Is it wrong to admit that like I don't, I really don't care about LeBron's season? 
that he played. I mean, I think, sure, it's it's impressive. He played 82 games. He dragged this no-name crew all the way back to the NBA Finals in a in a in an Eastern Conference that literally had no superstars, nobody on the level of the Western Conference. Is it wrong to admit that I don't really care about what he did this season? No, because I don't care either. That's <laughs> why we're related. Yes. That's why we're related. And there's yeah. many other fans who feel the exact same way. Yeah, I, I just don't really care. I, it's, a, it's impressive. I Logically, okay, here, maybe here's another way of saying it too. Logically, I completely understand and I am completely blown away by what he is, how he has managed to direct this season and get himself back into another finals. Very, very impressive. Very impressive. But emotionally, it does nothing for me. It does nothing for me at all. So actually, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna pose that question to the Goldcast Nation here. Well, we're we got to wrap up here pretty soon. Here, what do you think? about LeBron James' season. Are you impressed? And if you are, that's totally fine. Like, I don't I don't disagree with you. You're not wrong. I'm just saying it's, like, not really a thing for me. Um, how do you feel about the Warriors if possibly on the verge of gaining a second dynasty? Do you think this will be the greatest area of San Francisco sports? I'm going to say this, Ray. I'm going to tell you what will make this the greatest era. And you already know what I'm going to say. Jimmy G has got to deliver a chip by 2020. He's got two more seasons. Totally doable. Totally doable. Totally, I believe it's totally doable. But if he, by some miracle, could deliver our sixth ring, the one that was taken away from us in 2012, if he could somehow deliver that ring by 2020, that would cap it off because the 49ers are the heart and soul of San Francisco sports. We all know this. They, We are the gold standard in the Bay Area. In the Bay Era, we are the gold standard. So I would love it if Jimmy G could give us one in the, ne- in the next two years. And if we can end, if we can get a Super Bowl in this decade, I will consider this the greatest era of San Francisco sports even over the 49ers dynasty in the 80s and 90s. What do you think? If the if the Niners somehow get a chip by 2020, is this the greatest era of San Francisco sports ever? I think so, because there's never been this much winning. I mean, the, the Niners were winning throughout the 80s, and the Giants went to one championship and lost in that span. You know, the only thing that comes close is the A's going to three straight the during that nothing. same span and beating the Giants in one of those three. But that was the only one they won. They won. They lost two out of three. So that was it. Yeah. And the Warriors lost. Not, they lost. They were shitty for since 75. So, you know, the and the, the Giants went again back in 2003 or 2005, I think it was. And they lost to that in that series, too. So the only time it's ever really aligned is now. The Giants have won f- three of five years they're you know they're trying to stay in it stay relevant right now but they're not too far removed from the Warriors success back in 2015 so those two those two dynasties are right next door to each other so the warrior the Warriors started when the Giants ended so it's it's still part of the same chain the still, still chain of success so Jimmy G and the Niners I believe are the next are the the team that is best poised to keep it going more so than the Raiders because we don't give a shit about them. But I think they're relevant anyway. And I don't think they're going to do much with John Gruden. Yet. But let's uh, talk for another episode. I only care about the, the 49ers, the Giants, and the Warriors. I don't care about any other team in the Bay. Raymond, before we uh, before we wrap up, why don't you let them know where can they find you? You can find me on Twitter at Ray Solis, and you can follow me on Instagram at Ray Solis one you can find me on Twitter at Rudy Solis third. Twitter, I said it's like a British person. Twitter at Rudy Solis three R D and Instagram at Rudy Solis three. So concludes another edition of the Gold Cast. We are the voice of the Bay. I'm your host, Rudy Solis the third, and with me is my brother, my co-host, 
Raymond Solis the first baby. Boom. Once again, thank you so much, Dwight Clark, for everything you've given to the Bay Area. The Our catch are pretty heavy for you, and uh, the catch. Uh, I've said this many times, and I'll say it many more times. There have been thousands and thousands of passes and thousands of balls caught in the NFL, and there'll be thousands more. But there's only one, the catch. So thank you, Dwight Clark, and uh, uh, rest in peace and condolences once again to the family, the Clark family. Uh, the 49ers family, 49ers organization, and uh, to Gold Cast Nation as well. And uh, thank you, Dwight Clark. Thank you so much for the memories. And I will uh, probably going to watch the NFC Championship game 1981 again in his honor. I'm going to watch it this weekend because it's such a great game. And uh, yep. So concludes another edition of the Gold Cast. We are the voice of the Bay. We'll see you next time. Same gold cast time, same gold cast channel. This is, is the gold cast.